Hi, this is Robert from OutbreakNewsToday.com, and this past Friday I was at the uh, Amoeba Summit 2019 in Orlando, hosted by the Jordan Smelsky Foundation, and I had the opportunity to talk to a very interesting physician named Dr. Umberto Liriano, and he's one of the physicians that treated a Naglaria survivor named Sebastian de Leon. So uh, check this out. It's a pretty good interview. Okay. Well, I'm now joined by Dr. Umberto Liriano. He's a pediatric critical care physician who has actually treated a patient with Naglaria fowleri. Dr. L um, Liriano. Hi, nice, nice to meet you, sir. Um, can you go ahead and recount the scene in 2016 when Sebastian de Leon was hospitalized and what was going through your head? And yeah, absolutely. Well, he um, presented to the emergency department um, that it was a Sunday at one o'clock in the afternoon um, with normal symptoms of fever, um, but he did have some rigidity, you know, concerning for meningitis. Um, the fact that he was from Fort Lauderdale, you know, we didn't ask if you've been to lakes or anything like that. We just thought bacterial meningitis. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, our Sheila Black, our laptician, calls and says, I see an amoeba. At that moment, it, you know, he, Sebastian was probably my sixth case. Um, I trained in Dallas, and in Dallas it was very common. Sure. And so I immediately called CDC, which is what I needed to do, um, because they had a special drug at that point, metelfacin, which I... I knew of, but we didn't have it in town, I thought. You thought? I thought. Mm -hmm. And so when they called me, no, you have the drug now in Orlando, I was like, oh, wow. So immediately I spoke to the emergency doctor, Dr. Hernandez, and I said, you know, let's start the amphotericin drug, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the cocktail medicines, but that's the one we all have in the hospitals, while I called it, you know, to find out about the other medicine. And so, you know, it's it's a 99% death rate. You know, I. I I knew this is Sunday at three o'clock now in the afternoon. I knew that there is, um, you know, one percent chance of this kid surviving. I needed to do whatever I could to help and try. And so, the kid comes up to the ICU. He's mildly awake. He's, you know, headache. The lights were bothering him. And so, at the same time, my nurse is going downstairs to the first floor um, to get the medicine because it's Sunday. It's not open. The CEO is traveling to Boston. His son comes in the pajama, his pajamas and um, brings the medicine to the hospital. And that's the first time I've ever seen the medicine. So from Profounda. The from Profounda, the company right, right. in Orlando, the son gets it, brings it to the hospital in his pajamas. And my nurse is like, you know, she goes down there almost like a drug <laughs> transaction in the street. <laughs> um, she was so nervous. But this was the first time I've ever seen the medicine. And the medicine was a pill form. I'm thinking liquid, IV form, pill form. Um, luckily, Sebastian was still awake. Mm -hmm. And immediately I said, I just took the medicine out and I said, can you drink the medicine, you know, can you drink, can you drink the pill? And sure enough, he drank the pill. Mm -hmm. That was the first time ever out of all my cases that ever happened. And so at that moment, I knew I had a fighting chance. I don't know what, but I knew it was better than 1%. It grew like 40, 50% of the chance. So I told the family, hey, listen, do not look at the news. That same weekend, there was three kids in the country that had the same um, disease. And one just passed away in South Carolina. And so I said, do not look at the news. I have to do this, this, this. Put him in a hypothermia, put him in a coma, intubate him to help him breathe, um, because this goes very quick. Can you explain the put him, putting him in a coma part? Yes. How does that work? So it's chemically induced. And mm -hmm. so we use a medicine called pentobarbital. Um, and it'll give him, it put, it's putting his brain pretty much asleep. And so the thought process is, if the brain is not, um, you know, demanding ox demanding too much metabolic demands, it's sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so it's like in a coma that we put him under the medicine. And so that is done by pentobarbital. Um, but he's, he won't be able to breathe on his own. Mm -hmm. And so I told the family I have to put a breathing tube um, and then put him in the coma. Sometimes the medicine so, it's so, um, um, I don't want to say toxic, it's more, um, it's very effective to the blood pressure. So it drops a little bit of the blood pressure. So we have to sometimes use uh, medicine to help his blood pressure maintain. So we did, we added dopamine on board. And so at that moment I had a breathing tube, he was in a coma, and then I called my neurosurgeon. And so here I go, okay, I'm thinking about the trophozoite, the amoeba. The trophozoite has three forms, but one of them, when it's, it doesn't like the environment, it becomes a cyst. It could be either cold temperature, it could be a medicine or anything. And they actually looked at, um, in the lab that when, when metaphosin and Provido is 
introduced with the amoeba, the amoeba becomes a cyst to try to protect itself. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I thought if I cooled him, um, it'll become a cyst and it'll probably slow down both the brain from swelling and the amoeba from growing. Is that when it's non motile? Right, that's when that's motile. And yeah. so at least it's non motile and then the brain doesn't swell and I could either pause what I have right now, call more help or do whatever I have to, but just cool it because no one else has done this before. The cooling process just came out in my head just to see if I could slow everything down. And so sure enough, I cooled them down to 33 degrees Celsius. And in some labs, 33 is where the amoeba starts to grow. Mm -hmm. So, but in my mind, I said, let me at least slow it down. It's definitely not gonna like the environment. And so I think by that, it'll become a cyst form and give it time for, for the medicine to work. And so it, he was at least cooled about three or four days. Um, and there's risk for that too. I was just gonna say, yeah. So yeah. then cooling has risks. Yeah. So um, hypothermia, you have organs that will go into failure, sure. liver, kidney, um, lungs. And so yeah. you can't do more than four days on average. And so um, luckily at the same time, we were sent the CDC CSF samples. These samples every day will tell us when it's positive, positive. I kept on telling on day four, they finally told us that it was negative. Great. Which is the same time we were starting to rewarm him. Mm -hmm. And so we were warming about 0.5 degrees Celsius every six hours. We couldn't rewarm him. And that's the other thing. You can't warm him really fast either. Mm -hmm. um, because they come into shock, the organs. And so we started warming him. We knew at least in the CSF it was negative at this point. We had the amoeba killed. So we were very excited. But we didn't know what was under there. We didn't know what his brain function was still. And so he finally, back to normal temperature, and we stopped the penobarb coma. Um, and then we start releasing the sleeping medicine, the sedation medicine, and that's when we noticed that he was breathing over the ventilator. So at least we knew he had midbrain function, that he's able to breathe. We didn't know what his other you know, cerebral functions were. So we waited a little bit, like a few more days, once all the medicine, all the sleepy sedation medicine were off, he finally opens his eyes. And you know, we're excited, you know, eyes opening, he's able to breathe over the ventilator, He's even starting to speak with the tube in his mouth. And you had a funny story about that in the presentation. <laughs> yes. Can you yeah. share that? Yes, absolutely. And so once you know, we told him, okay, we're going to take the tube out. It's time to um, take it out. And he's like, please, you know, his head is moving. He's like, please take it out. So we take it out, and we're all waiting. You know, everyone's in the room, family and ourselves and the team, and we're looking. And he's like, I can't breathe. And we're like, oh, my God, we're so excited. Like, we were just so happy that cognitively he knows that he can't breathe. But the family is like, wait, help him. He can't breathe. And we're like, no, that's a good sign. He can't breathe. But they didn't understand. And so we're trying to tell him, no, the fact that he's able to tell us that he has have trouble breathing was amazing. Yeah, amazing. Absolutely. And to them, they were like, that doesn't make sense. But it was great. It was great. So, yeah, he, he, he survived at least, you know, we didn't know what neural deficits he would have. But the fact that he was talking moving all extremities and co cognitive aware of everything that was going mm -hmm. around and we knew we had beat of it. Yeah. So he had to go through some rehab. And yes. How, how is he doing today? Do you know? Oh, he's doing great. So it's been about three years now. He's in college. Um, he's debating about becoming a doctor. He's working. He has a girlfriend and he was supposed to come today to the conference and but he's like, I'm in college. I have work to do. I have real life. I'm an adult now. And so it's great. It's great. It's great to hear. It. So. so last question. When you think back on it today, what crosses your mind? Oh, I, I don't think, um, one is the previous ones that I had, the cases that I had prior, I wish that what we've done today was made aware around the whole world. Um, and like I said, I've only had six confirmed cases. There's a lot of cases that are not confirmed. Mm -hmm. And now that what we know, I wish I could, you know, use it on them. That's one. Two is the fact that, you know, it's this you know we've had news coverage we've had this summit almost every year and the fact that i still get called we have a case going on now in dallas and i still get called um you know to help and so that makes me aware that people are aware you well, know but you, you have this great experience that oh absolutely so many don't, so many uh, don't, absolutely right? and yeah. so that's that's where and again it's hard to do research on kids because i mean you just the only way to do it is after they passed away. And so mm -hmm. you can't do it during live. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, a lot, I get questioned, like, what made you think that? I'm like, you know, honestly, I've seen this several times and I knew at this point, let me try whatever I could. And, and mm -hmm. for me, the difference between every other case was cooling. You know, slow everything down. Um, and again, it's hard because people, researchers want research, you know, sure. and so it's, it's hard on children. You have to do either adult data and kids, it's rare you ever get able to do that research. 
but it worked. And so I said, try it anyway. What's, what's it gonna hurt? You know, it's try it. You still have three or four days before you warm them. It worked in my case, please try it. And so and today actually they're cooling the other chocolate. So. Well, great story. Uh, Dr. Liriano, I appreciate it. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks again, guys.